song called a chest pass, right? And I used to get them in the face. <laughs> I just wanted to know that she respects the game of netball. What even is a netball? Harrison, you are a freak! This is the sport evolving at its very best. Unbelievable. <laughs> Can you believe it? I'm Bridget Tunnicliffe and today I'm talking to New Zealander Shirley Hooper who's been voted in as Vice President of World Netball. Welcome, congratulations on your new appointment. Thank you. I'm secretly quite chuffed. When I look at all you've done over the past 30 odd years, you're so qualified for the job. We'll talk a bit about that later, the path you've taken, which has led you to this point. But first, your appointment coincides with a new direction for the international body, no longer known as the INF. New name, new logo, you're now known as World Netball. This was all launched early last month. What led to that rebrand? We need to, you know, I think women's sport and and actually women's sport generally is undervalued commercially across the world, not just netball. I think you would talk to women's rugby, you know, women's football, women's anything really. And what we were wanting to do commercially, we started working with a commercial agency, CSM, and we wanted to reframe the positioning of netball and to go out to uh, potential commercial partners with a different story about our sport. So that that was the first objective. And, and really, when you think about it, International Netball Federation doesn't sound particularly dynamic. It doesn't sound like an organisation that's driving our sport forward. And it, it just felt very static. Even our logo could have been, you could have taken the words International Netball Federation off and put any ball sport in there. So we wanted to rebrand um, ourselves as World Netball. It's a trend that other sports have gone down simplifies things probably I think makes it clearer that it's not just a federation that's about rules it's about a dynamic international body that is is working with its members to drive the sport forward. At the same time World Netball launched a strategic plan to help shape the future of the sport Uh, one of the big things that comes through in that strategic plan is the focus on growing the sport raising netball Ball's profile to reach wider audiences. It has felt to me that the international governing body has been quite a quiet organisation, not a lot of trumpeting about how great the sport is. But I've noticed little changes yes. over the last 18 months, things like the weekly newsletter highlighting some of the initiatives that are happening in different regions, more active on social media. Uh, was it time that World Netball did a lot more to promote the sport? Yes, to be honest, I think it was time and timing was was. The timing is everything. We also had a new uh, chairperson takeover. So Liz Nickel, who was the former CEO of UK Sport and had been with UK Sport for a number of years, she came on board. And with that, she brought um, quite a lot of you know, new and freshness of thinking and and having been in that driving force for you know, what is the equivalent of, say, Sport New Zealand but on a much larger scale in the UK, um, she brought a lot of energy into, into that role and we just changed the places that we were able to invest. We also, it was a pretty profitable 2019 World, world Camps for us, so we were able to take that um, surplus funds and apply them to ramping up our digital space, uh, recruiting, we just recently recruited a part-time head of events and we're going through the process of, of recruiting a part-time netball de- development lead. So we've been able to do a little more. Uh, when you have resources, it's amazing what you can do. Uh, we just need to find ways to get more resources. Mm. And the strategic plan also talks about netball helping people reach their full potential and how it can actually change people's lives. And there, there are living examples out there, like someone like South African Captain Bongi in Somi, one of eight children, grew up in abject poverty in Durban. She said it scares her to think of what would have happened if she hadn't started playing netball, says her first job was because of netball, going to university was because yeah. of netball. So it's no exaggeration that netball really has changed lives for some people. No, and that's one of the things that we're doing our best to lift those stories and give those stories more more profile. Peace Proskovia is another from Uganda who, you know, you you hear the stories of of 
how they grew up and, you know, playing netball with screwed up plastic bags all tied together with rubber bands and bare feet. And and they've gone on from there to, to be captains of their national teams, to be playing in, you know, Super Leagues around the world. You look at um, Mwaiik and Wenda who came here and played you know, for the tactics here. Mm. And, and you look at the opportunities that netball has given those women. And But even in New Zealand, to be honest, Bridget, the, the stories that you will hear of, you know, Sulu Tony Fitzpatrick, um, there's a number of them who we've heard and read their stories, Catherine Latu, over the years. And you realise that sport has that ability to reframe your your beginnings in some ways and give you opportunities and that's the same across all sports if I'm honest but what we're trying to do is to really really emphasize those opportunities that it's created for these people so you'll see us over the course of the next 18 months two years start to really tell those stories through social media and through um, other other means of just bringing those stories to life Mm. because they they are Netball is an amazing sport with opportunities it presents to particularly women. And if you look at you look at netball's beginnings in New Zealand, you know, where it was because of the strength and power of some very courageous women um, back in the day that we have the sport that we have now. You know, we lead the world between New Zealand and Australia in terms of setting rules, establishing rule books, you know, working to establish the International Netball Federation through uh, the, the people that I knew as I was coming through my netball career, whether that was Dawn Jones and Taylor, they were pioneering women who have done amazing things and in a very selfless way. I think that's been, for me, almost the biggest joy of being involved on the international stage is seeing more of those stories and being able to hear more about just how the sport has changed lives. Obviously, it would have been nice for us if Nepal New Zealand had won the bid to host the 2023 World Cup. We lost out to Cape Town, but I can totally understand why World Nepal went with South Africa. I guess it was a chance to get more visibility in that part of the world. It was actually incredibly close, if I'm completely oh. honest. It was. <laughs> it came. It came down to the wire. You know, Nepal New Zealand in many ways deserved the opportunity to... You know, the last time they hosted a World Champs was diving in at the last minute when Fiji, you know, problems happened in Fiji. So in many ways, Netball New Zealand is a really safe pair of hands and mm. we know would have done an amazing, an amazing, amazing job. So what we were weighing up was the professionalism and the certainty of a Netball New Zealand bid versus the opportunity to take Netball to, to a continent in terms of Africa. We tried with the World Youth Cup very successfully was hosted in Botswana. So first time a netball event had happened in Africa. And it's unique, right? They don't events in in, in World Youth Cup doesn't doesn't quite run the way a World Youth Cup would in New Zealand, for example. But that's part of, in many ways, part of our strategy as World Netball is to give these countries an opportunity to shine. But it had a unique African flavor. And that's what we we believe that um all things going well, that Africa will, and hopefully COVID has calmed itself down, um, that Africa will put on an amazing event. They have huge support from their government. Um, their government really wants to make this a successful event. Cape Town, from all accounts, is a beautiful city. Um, Cecilia Molokwane, the, the South African and African president, is a force to be reckoned with. She is incredibly strong. Um, I think African women need to be incredibly strong, to be honest, to, to do what they do. Her latest mission I see is to get a dedicated netball channel through the um, the broadcasters in South Africa and mm. possibly stretching out through Africa. So they have really big ambitions and increasingly a sense of belief in themselves, which I, which I think was you know might have been missing in in previous years, but they're an amazing, amazing continent. And, you know, when you look at five out of our top 15 nations uh, from the African continent at the moment, um, and, and four of those, I would suggest, are nations that don't have a lot of resources but have an incredible natural talent and skill. Um, so I, I'm really looking forward to seeing how they are boosted and they grow um, over the coming couple of years as that event comes to fruition as well. 
And the strategic plan does mention the Olympics. It says World Netball wants to deliver an international event strategy that showcases the sport to more people. And that includes a clear and credible position on the Olympic Games. So the goal of one day being included in the Olympic program is there. Uh, Realistically, that's quite some way off. It is a very long game. (laughs) It is a very long game. Interesting and I've never come across this before, it's actually embedded in our constitution that our members want us to try to become an Olympic sport. I think mm-hmm. in many in many countries, I mean, obviously, there's the honour honor and glory of being in the Olympics and everyone wants the tattoo and the ring. But the reality is for many sports, it also is a pathway to funding. And for a lot of our nations, it's that's the magic key to being able to access Olympic solidarity funding or national activities program funding or the, the likes of funding streams that the IOC pushes out to its national Olympic committees. So yes, it is a long game, but we think the biggest the biggest opportunity will be when the Olympics is hosted by a netball loving nation. And with Brisbane sort of feeling like it's front running for 2032, then we're starting to work with Netball Australia and starting to talk to the IOC about what netball might need to look like, what the opportunities are, um, but yeah, early days and a lot of water to go under the bridge, but we are having the conversations. Well, wow, you're getting in there early. You kind of need to, right? The cycle of, mm. um, you know, there's, there's a number of sports I'm aware of. I remember talking to Susie Simcock about squashes, you know, attempts to become accepted as an Olympic sport and the number of years that they went through and the amount of investment that they've tried still unsuccessfully to become an Olympic sport. So it is a long game, but without a plan, you're never going to achieve anything. So we're in the, I would suggest, the early stages of starting to formulate that plan. But Mm. I would hate a headline to read, you know, netball in the Olympics in 2032. It'll be a lot of water to come under the bridge before that happens. But we're certainly giving our best shot. And it might be a variation like Fast Five? Yeah, I think that's the interesting part of of Olympics. You have to be realistic about what the IOC's aspirations are as well in terms of both um, number of, you know, they've put a cap on the number of participants. So if you want to bring in a competition with the number of players that you need for a, you know, a full seven-a-side world world champs equivalent, that's a lot of people, that's a lot of time, and that's a lot of venue time. So you go, is it more likely that the, the shorter form of the game might have more, more appeal, the same as rugby's done? Um, and you'd have to go, yeah, probably. And then you, the other one that you have to think through is the gender equity aspect, so which is IOC's stated goal of, um, of you know, having a gender balance. And I think they're almost there with that. Those are the challenges that we're going to need to work through and collaborate with our members on is thinking through Fast Five, you know, is that an option? Gender balance, what might that look like? You know, where do the men fit in our, in our sport? Because undoubtedly they are outstanding, as we've seen in New Zealand, probably more than any other country, outstanding players. And we need to work, work together and collaborate to figure out um, what that path is going forward. The strategic plan does address male participation in that it talks about continuing to build on Apple's unique female-focused foundations while embracing boys' and men's participation through collaboration and, and support. So I guess it's getting that balance right. And it's easy for us in New Zealand to say, men, come and play. But in some countries where women's rights don't really exist, where Women can be forced into marriages, for example. Netball might be the only escape and safe place. So opening up the game to men is not going to work everywhere, is it? And Bridget, that is exactly right. And that's the story that often doesn't get told. I think there's a, it's an easy headline, right, to say, you know, world netball won't embrace men. Um, The reality is that we are more than open to embracing men, but we have to do it in a way where our female-focused beginnings are honoured, respected, and that our women are still safe in the environments in which they play. So it's very much a a balancing act. Um, And I don't think there is a one size fits all with with netball necessarily across all nations. And and you'll see that in the strategic plan too. We talk about people, we want our national federations to have the right to make their own decisions in terms of how men fit into, into the game. It's really hard when you're in New Zealand. We're so egalitarian. I mean, 
I don't know, but it feels like at the moment there's probably more men umpires on the court than the ANZ champs than there are women umpires sometimes. Mm, you know, you fine, we, make we fine umpires. It. They're fabulous umpires. And that series was an, a stroke of genius from Netball New Zealand uh, with the Silver Ferns playing the men. They It was captivating netball. Um, so it's easy sometimes, as you as you put it so eloquently, to forget in New Zealand that there are different parts of the world where women's empowerment, women's leadership, women's safety becomes netball as a vehicle for that. So we need to make sure that we don't lose that whilst also finding a way to embrace men through the process. Oh, I sound like I'm embracing men a lot, don't I? Sorry, <laughs> men out there who might be listening to this. <laughs> You've been involved in World Netball through one of the most challenging times for the sport, navigating through COVID. How difficult was the decision to cancel the Netball World Youth Cup? In some ways, to be honest, when it came down to it, very, very easy. If you put your athlete at the core of your decision making, then inviting athletes, young athletes from all over the world to come into a situation where they would probably have had to quarantine for two weeks coming in and then in many cases had to quarantine for two weeks coming out. The health and safety risks were quite significant. So we we went through a process where, you know, one of the things I think that makes us a little unique as an, an international sporting body is we are very collaborative with our member nations. So we brought everyone together through Zoom, the wonder of Zoom, which has been the best thing about COVID, I think. Um, we brought everyone together to actually talk through the challenges, all of those those nations who had qualified, to really talk through it, for them to raise their concerns, for them to talk about, you know, in many of these countries, netball had stopped. So even just putting a team together, funding a team to get to Fiji, the cost of getting to Fiji was potentially going to be enormous because how many flights were actually going to go to Fiji? So there were there were a lot of it was a very collaborative decision that in the end became, in many ways, an obvious decision to make. And we also felt it was really important to make it reasonably early. You know, you've seen many national sporting international sporting organisations leaving some of these decisions very late, which makes it very difficult for players for administrators. So we came out probably earlier than most to make that decision. And, you know, you look at the situation now in Fiji, which mm. is heartbreaking. And and you know it was the right decision. But the hard, if I'm, if I'm honest, the hardest part, though, is the opportunities that those young women have missed out on. You know, there's a whole cohort of women, of young women now, who haven't had that benefit of playing in a intense international environment against each other and building those friendships those connections but also building that experience in their toolkit and you know less that concerns me a little less in countries like New Zealand Australia those players are still getting exposed whether it's through the NNL or the Australian you know league that runs under the Super League or equivalents in the UK but for many of those other nations those athletes haven't had won't have that exposure and I think that's going to leave a gap and ability for a little while to come. And that for me was probably personally was the most heartbreaking is thinking of the reality of those individuals who have missed out on that opportunity and are going to be aged out by the time the next opportunity comes along. Mm. It's heartbreaking. I want to talk a bit about your background and what's led you to this position. Clearly you've got a passion for netball and it's weaved its way into a whole lot of the roles you've held over the years. You've been involved in a lot of watershed moments for the sport, whether it be through marketing, broadcasting or sport governance. We'll just touch on a few of them. Marketing manager at Bendon, 1989 to 1991. You oversaw a sponsorship deal for the National Netball League in New Zealand, which at the time was the biggest sponsorship deal for any female sport in New Zealand. That must have been pretty major at the time. It was a really big deal. And the interesting part of it is it was a guy by the name of Charles Bidwell, who, who was the chairperson, I think, for memory of Ceramco, who owned Bendon in those days. He was the one that actually said, you know, we should do it. We should get in. You know, we want to lift the profile of, of um, Bend On to women and let's have a go at sports. So we sponsored the Bend On League and we also sponsored, did a joint sponsorship with Nutramedics of the women's tennis. It was so much fun. We could do things that, you know, we, I remember we um, we had a fashion parade in the middle of the court on 
the final state, both for the tennis and the netball. And we had the 91 ZM cheerleaders dressed up in their um, in bend and lingerie, you know, our sports gear, our you know, leather jackets, and bits and pieces, just doing an amazing choreographed routine that was electrifying. And we got we got some negative press for it, but we got an overwhelming positive reaction to it. And that's gold, right? That is gold mm. when you've got that many mm. eyeballs watching sport and you can deliver your message about a brand in quite different ways. And that's that's the missed opportunity that many brands are missing with netball. You, if you sit down and you really analyse the numbers and you look at the number of household shoppers that netball delivers, and we know that household shoppers have a huge influence in the household spending patterns, there should be more brands lining up to sponsor netball in New Zealand and the world, and that's my mission. That's probably asked me what my biggest goal is and that vice president space and chairing mm. the commercial committee, mm. that's my biggest goal is to, over the time that I'm in this role, to see some significant movement in the number of sponsors that we can bring to the sport and investment from them and in return that we can deliver for them what they need, connection to household shoppers. Sounds exciting. And between 1995 to 98, General Manager Marketing TVNZ, you're a driving force behind getting netball aired on free-to-air television in New Zealand. You're the founding chair. Later on, you were the founding chair of Northern Mystics. At one point, you were also director of Trans-Tasman Netball Limited before becoming the chairperson. This was the organisation responsible for running the ANZ Championships. You also helped, were involved in helping set up the Northern Stars franchise and you were on the Netball New Zealand board from 2009 to 2018. You were on the board when the Laura Lehman eligibility saga started to play out and the board took a pretty strong stand that it had to protect the New Zealand domestic competition so players needed to play in the New Zealand League to be eligible for the Silver Ferns. How difficult was it for the board to balance the interests of that competition while also knowing that if the Silver Ferns didn't have Laura Lehman, it would be harder for them to win? Uh, probably single-handedly one of the most difficult decisions. That we that we made, you know, actually, just prior to that, probably one of the the other very difficult decision was um, bringing the Trans Tasman mm. Nipple Limited to a to a close. You know, we had gone into that ten years earlier. Um, we were incredibly blessed, and still are. Nipple in New Zealand is incredibly blessed to have the sponsorship or that have the support of Sky Television, and you know, a broadcaster that is committed to funding sport, funding women's sport, they do an amazing job. And they had funded the Trans-Tasman uh, Championships. But they were a big funder. In fact, they, they were the only broadcast funder um, because when that, that joint venture was formed in Australia, they were having to pay to get netball on television in Australia. So Netball New Zealand at the time, I wasn't on the board at the time, but they when they formed that joint venture, they knew that Australia were very good at, at commercial sponsorship. We were very good at, we had a great broadcast partner if you can bring the two together, then uh, we could have a match made in heaven, potentially. Also, we felt at the time that if our players were exposed to or more regularly to the Australian style of play, we would therefore see some improvement. Because you've got to remember, as context, those were years when we were getting beaten progressively by, by Australia and it was pretty hard to get a breakthrough. So we were looking for, the board at the time were looking for some ability to see if they could leverage it up by getting those players to play more regularly against the Australian standard. Fast forward then 10 years down the track and or nine years down the track as it was and when we we did strategically as a board looked at it and just said so what's changed have we achieved those? Mm. That the, the, um, the blowouts was, were getting worse weren't they by the end of it? We, we I think they by were. the end of it we didn't even win a single game over there in that final season. No, it was, it was fundamentally depressing. You know, we'd won once with Magic, but in a in a team stacked with Silver Ferns. And we were still paying to get netball broadcast on television in Australia. So we made the call that actually if we hunkered back into our own context, we weren't achieving what we what we needed to achieve. So we we made that decision, talked to Netball Australia about it, said, look, we're going to need more investment. They said, you know what? If we're going to invest in something, it's probably not going to be this. So we parted actually quite amicably in the end. I think the media liked to play it out as some massive divorce, but actually it was a it was 
something that had happened and then we we came back to New Zealand and formed what is now the ANZ Premiership. The mm. single biggest risk to us, though, was that we knew that Australia were positioning themselves as the best super league in the world and they had an open, as they still do, open approach to imports. So the biggest risk to us was losing some of our top silver ferns to go and play in that competition and then our competition in New Zealand being a lesser and uh, not of a high enough standard that we were going to stimulate and challenge the rest of our players. So it became very important to us to retain those silver ferns in the New Zealand system. And Laura, yeah, uh, to did, be honest, it was gutting. I will never forget mm. the netball awards and Laura was in tears yeah, apologising. Yeah, for that. I remember that. Do you remember that? Yeah, because she won, and my heart she won broke the, play, the award that night. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> And she acknowledged it. She acknowledged it in her. And, you know, and and when you're a board member and you're sitting there and you're going, oh, my gosh, you know, this is breaking my heart. But it was a risk to us if we had have mm. let those players go. How many players might have gone to Australia? Who would know? But it was a tough decision at mm. the time. I think what was the bravest decision actually for the board now post, you know, as we've seen unfold with the World Cup and with Knowles coming back, et cetera, is to be able to go – you know what circumstances have changed, we're going to change that decision and we can. So I had huge admiration for this new board when they took that decision. So Shirley, you grew up in Matamata, started playing netball as a young girl, then got into umpiring. So you obviously love the game. Now the Vice President of World Netball, could you ever have imagined that you would achieve this position? To be honest, no. No, not in a moment. And as you say, little girl from Matamata, we had 15 kids in my school at the time. Half of them were my cousins. Uh, we lived in a tiny rural school out by the Kaimai Tunnel. And I often, I laugh about it with my mum and dad, you know. You look at the opportunities that have come my way because of this wonderful sport. And they're not quite as, you know, I, I didn't play on, well, actually I did play with bare feet, but not quite the peace and the why and the one stories. But, you know, it's it has led to amazing things and it's opened amazing doors. So I feel, what I do feel though is a sense of responsibility in this role to acknowledge I've only got to where I've got to because of fabulous other women that have given me opportunities along the way and supported me along the way. And that's my job to do the same now for the other women, other young girls, the athletes, the administrators, the umpires, the officials, the coaches that are following is it's my responsibility to make sure that I leave the sport in a better better space with more opportunities for more people. So I take that with pride, but also with a real understanding of how big that job is. <laughs>